Hello, welcome to the Thursday, April 6, 2017 edition of the Santanet Storm Tennis Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier has an interesting diary about how attackers are going after sites and indicators that are commonly whitelisted. For example, the top 1000 most popular sites. These sites are often whitelisted, but you'll find sites like Twitter and GitHub or such among these sites, which of course can also be used as command and control channels, which of course makes it more difficult for the analyst to really filter out what's going on. Same, of course, for URLs. A lot of ransomware, for example, uses search.php or URLs like that, that are very commonly used in non-malicious sites. So again, this makes not a great indicator to find malicious or infected hosts. And earlier today, to get ready for the webcast, we'll have uh, later on Thursday about the Struts 2 vulnerability. I was looking through my honeypot logs again, and I saw that there's quite a bit of activity that's actually targeting Windows servers with ransomware. In this particular case, they try to install the Kerber ransomware on the host that claimed to be vulnerable for the Struts 2 vulnerability. A Google search will show you how others have reported this over the last few days as well. This morning when I ran this ransomware first in my little honeypot, a Windows system that actually has antivirus installed, it still slipped past the antivirus. Antivirus coverage wasn't that great. End of the day today, that's no longer true. We do now have pretty good coverage for this variant. And researchers at Kaspersky are reporting about an interesting compromise of a Brazilian bank. Apparently, this bank lost control over all 36 domains it uses to do business with. Once attackers had control of these domains, they were able to redirect traffic to these domains at will. They were able to intercept email. And most importantly, they were able to intercept HTTP requests to the bank's online banking websites. Because they did have control over these domains and most SSL registrars only require you to prove control over a domain in order to give you a certificate. The attackers were able to use Let's Encrypt in order to make pretty good looking SSL websites. Now, certificate transparency is one particular feature that probably would have helped or should have helped to detect this compromise. There are now a number of free services, and I've talked about this before, that can be used to alert you whenever someone does issue a certificate for a domain that you own. But instead, numerous customers in this case were infected with malware. Sadly, it's not really clear how all of this happened according to the media report about this event. And I guess that's what Kaspersky found is they suggest that spear phishing may have been used in order to obtain domain credentials from some administrator. But apparently there is no definite proof what exactly happened. Securing the DNS infrastructure, of course, is always critical and two-factor authentication should be a must for anything related to your DNS settings. And Google released updates for Android this week. There's a total of 102 security issues that are being addressed, 15 of which are critical. And yes, the stage fright library is again affected by these vulnerabilities. Of course, for many Android users, it may take a while for this update to arrive on their respective device. And yes, uh, this update also fixes the Broadcom vulnerability that I mentioned yesterday that was also fixed by Apple this week. 
And Radver is reporting that they found in their honeypots what they are calling a pricker bot, essentially destructive malware. Now, we have seen this before, and for example, industrial control system, if you remember in these attacks against the Ukraine, some devices had their firmware flashed. This one is a little bit going a similar route. It's attacking devices with Telnet open, so code probably copied from from Mirai or something similar is going through using known default passwords. And once it's in the device, instead of installing itself on the device and just flooding the internet looking for more vulnerable systems, this particular malware will just erase the disk on the system. The code that Radware here shows doesn't really show a sort of a firmware flash, but it definitely trashes every single device that it finds. It also drops internet connectivity to the device. So while this device may not be permanent as Radware suggests and the device is certainly recoverable, it will be quite difficult to recover the device that was affected by this malware. Well, and that's it for today. So remember, there will be a webcast at 11 a.m. Eastern. It will be recorded if you're on the West Coast. There will be a recording available probably sometime in the afternoon, and we'll talk about the Struts 2 vulnerability. And well, otherwise, that's it for today, and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.